For those who are very familiar and maybe not so familiar with the New Testament, it is obvious that many times during the personal work of our Lord on earth that he was put to the test by the Jewish religious leaders. Such passages as Matthew twenty-two eighteen and Mark eight eleven, along with Luke ten twenty-five, are three of passages that indicate that point. When you read about these periods of testing, you see that they did not come from the hearts of people who were honest and who were good and who were seeking to know the Lord's will that they could do it. These people, the leaders of the Jews, for the most part, were very crafty and underhanded. And they were asking him questions many times or dealing with him in such a way as to find some accusation that they could have stand up against the Son of God. Luke 20 and verse 23 and John chapter 8 and verse 6. When we come down to Matthew chapter 19, we have an example of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of the Jews, attempting to ensnare our Lord. The passage reads in 19 and verse 3, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. I pause here to point out in the King James Version, tempt can mean a solicitation to do evil or to sin, or it can mean to put to the test. And here it has to do with simply putting Jesus to the test. That's what they were up to. But they were doing it not in honesty, as I said earlier, to learn the truth that they might do it, they were trying to ensnare him and to find fault against him, to ruin him among the Jews as far as his influence is concerned. So they came testing or tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And that's important to understand. Now, there's another thing that doesn't appear so in the scriptures <clears throat> that governed the Jewish thinking on matters of divorce. And you have to step outside the scriptures to understand the background of where these folks were coming from. The Pharisees' question reflects two schools of Jewish thought concerning the interpretation of the statement that Moses in Deuteronomy 24, 1, Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, had written. And here's what he said. When a man takes a wife and marries her, then it shall be. If she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some unseemly thing in her, that he shall write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of the house. Again, that's Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1. Now, the expression that's rendered indecency or an indecent thing in the American Standard 1901, it's unseemly, occurs... In Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 23, 1 through, or rather 14, Deuteronomy 23, 14, and is literally, according to the Hebrew, the nakedness of a thing, and signifies most probably some improper, indecent behavior. You can find that in the International Critical Commentary on Deuteronomy by Driver. Now, a fellow by the name of Rabbi Hillel was a very, very liberal person in his interpretation of this passage. And the Jews who followed his teachings believed that divorce could be obtained for the most 
trivial reasons. You see it manifested in for every cause. There was another rabbi by the name of Shammai. And he emphasized the word nakedness and said it taught that there must be shameful conduct on the part of the wife or unchastity. Now, in this same commentary, Driver on Deuteronomy correctly states, and I'm quoting, that the indecency denotes something short of actual unchastity may be inferred from the fact that for this a different penalty is enacted, which is death in 23. Also, the same expression is used not of what is immoral, but only what is unbecoming. Now, if you want to look more into what these two men taught, you can do that in looking at commentaries like this. But that's the background of why these Pharisees were doing what they were doing. They knew these things. They were not saying, what's the Lord's will on this matter? Could you give us a divine commentary on what Moses meant in Deuteronomy 24.1? They simply were seeking to entrap him. And Matthew, by inspiration, tells us that's the whole reason that they put this question to Jesus. So there's no interest here in finding the truth on their part. They're interested in destroying Jesus. Now, this happened routinely in his life on earth. I might say this, that we would do well as members of his spiritual body, individual Christians, to realize the people can do us the same way. But we can also, the best of our ability as human beings and members of the Lord's church, deal with them as Jesus dealt with these. Now, I'm not claiming we can know all Jesus knew. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying on the basis of what we know, we can deal with people and give them the truth on the matter. Because Jesus would take times like this, knowing what was in man, knowing their dishonesty, and turn it around to teach some marvelous and wonderful things. And that's what he did right here in Matthew 19. Now here's the best way to remember what these Pharisees were doing. There are two views, and I've gone over those views, from these different rabbis that govern the thinking of the Jews. Basically, they're coming to Jesus and saying, Now whose side are you on? That's what they're saying. Just keep that in mind. Whose side are you on in this business? Now, if Jesus agreed with Hillel and the common practice of the Jews, then you see they had thought this thing out. The Pharisees could side with Shammai and charge Jesus with being morally lax. If Jesus agreed with Shammai, he would most likely invoke the wrath of the majority, possibly be condemned for his treatment of sinners. Either way, Jesus would involve himself in the Jewish party dispute. And in so doing, he would alienate at least one segment of the audience. If Jesus declared that both Hillel and Shammai were an error, and that there is no divorce whatsoever, then you can see what would happen. The Jews could charge him with being at odds with Moses in chapter 24 and 1 of Deuteronomy because Moses said there was a writing of divorcement. Now you see how conniving these people are. They had hoped to hang him up either way he went. But a big failure on their part was they were simply looking at the law of Moses. Now, notice what Jesus did. He does not begin with the law of Moses. Jesus doesn't side with Hillel. He doesn't side with Shammai. But what does he do? He goes back beyond in time, the law of Moses, for the answer. The question is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What did Jesus say? No. And then he asked them a question. Oh, I would not want to be on the receiving end of a question Jesus asked. 
Now remember, these folks thought they knew the Bible as they had it then, especially the law of Moses. So he says, have you not read? Can you imagine that must have blistered them? Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning, watch what he does. He who made them from the beginning, he goes back to Genesis. Let's start the law of Moses. He goes back to where it all started in marriage in the home. He says, have you not read? And he made them male and female. And incidentally, let me just step aside from the matter he's directly dealing with here. I touched on this in class this morning. If people receive the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, and final, complete revelation of God, they would know among humankind there's male and female. Period. That's it. There's no male trying to trans... Uh, mute or whatever you want to call it, transform over into a female. There's no female trying to move back over to be a male. There's no male with male. There's no female with female. It's male and female, for that's the way he made them, period. That's it. Well, we're going to put you in jail over that. Well, let's see. When I get in jail, will it change the Bible? And if we're courageous and faithful, will it change what I teach? I can still say in jail they're male and female. Well, what are we going to, we're going to kill you for teaching there's only male and female. Okay, send me on to heaven. Been waiting for that all my life. You know, see, we don't think that way too much. But nevertheless, humankind is made up of two classes. Male and female. <laughs> this makes me chuckle a bit when I think about when you go into buying something in the plumbers and you ask for a male or female. I'm waiting for the day somebody says, well, we've got male and female. And then we've got this group over here that they're trying to transition. They don't know really which way they're going. So let's stay with those who are male and female and trying to get plumbing to fix together. You know, some things are just so stupid. And that's the way I describe it. Not just unscriptural, not contrary to God's will. They're contrary to common sense. So he says, don't you know that God in the beginning made them male and female? Then he said this, don't you know this? A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Then he said, the two shall become one, O-N-E, one flesh. And then he said, for what therefore God hath joined together. God, God hath joined together. Let not man put asunder. Now, some people have tried to say, well, man can put it asunder, but he shouldn't. That's not the force of let. What God joins together, let means don't even attempt to do it because you can't do it of your own human will. Can't do it. Yeah, but we see people in courts and so forth doing it. Not in God's mind. Not in God's mind. And that's what matters. Not according to God's will. And that's what matters. Yeah, most of the world believes otherwise. And the Lord knows it. And they'll give an account someday for believing contrary to the truth of God. So in his answer, Jesus went back to God's original plan in Genesis for marriage and answers their question. I must say I would like to be there watching their faces when he did it. Sometimes I wouldn't want to watch their faces, but, but other times I would like to have seen what would have happened. And no doubt at this point, the Jews felt that they had Jesus right where they wanted him. They thought he would be at odds by his answer with Moses. So they reply, and if this is the case, why then did Moses command to give a bill of divorcement and to put it away? You see, they don't even understand the design and the purpose of the law of Moses because they don't even understand the design and person of their existence as a nation. Remember, Paul says the law was our schoolmaster, pedagogos, tutor, to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Galatians 3, 24 verses following. The Jews think that we're here, we're above and beyond everybody else. When the Messiah comes, he'll be like a Solomon and David combined. He'll throw off the yoke of everybody else. And we'll be uh, people who are above and beyond everybody else on this earth. The law will be dominating. Never in the Old Testament is anything said about that. The Jews are here at that time because God had to have them to bring Christ into the world 
through the descendant of Abraham, through Jacob and his sons, and the tribe of Judah, and the family of David, all according to the flesh. And he did, Galatians 4 and verse 4. So, Jesus simply replies that this practice in the law of Moses that allowed for that bill of divorcement was because of the hardness of their own hearts. Do you realize what this is saying? That in the law of Moses, which is how the Jews approached God, that Moses was guided and allowed and permitted and directed to give a bill of divorcement. We've already read that. Because the Jews were so hard-hearted, so stubborn, so stiff-necked, so determined to do as they will no matter what, they might even, and look at what you have in the Old Testament that reveals this, even kill their wives to get out of it. In effect, this bill of divorcement protected the wife. He could get rid of her and, say, and, and thus God saved her life. But it was only for 1,500 years while the Jews approached God under the law of Moses. It never was permanent. And Jesus knows that, of course. So is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What does Jesus answer? No. No. But from the beginning, it, that is divorce, the practice of divorce, as they're talking about it, hath not been so. I'm saying all of this because if you don't watch out, you'll read Matthew 19 as if he's speaking in today's situation. You want to know the background of it. These people knew very well the current events and what dominated the Jewish society and religious thinking. They knew very well how to calculate and plan to try to trap Jesus. And that's what they're up to. But you can't trap Jesus. He'll trap you, but he, you can't trap Jesus. Now, then you come down to Matthew 19 and verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Notice that three times in seven verses, Jesus answers the Pharisees' question, with a negative and then sets forth the one true reason for putting away a spouse divorcing another spouse in effect what he did he went back to the general rule of marriage and divorce that was started back in Eden with the founding of marriage in the home with Adam and Eve he then explains why there was a deviation in that 1,500 years in which the Jews approached God under the law of Moses. And he explains why there was a bill of divorcement allowed. Now we must understand in the development of the scheme of redemption and God coming down to the stream of time that he worked with man. And as Paul would say on Mars Hill as he preached to those pagans, in the times of this ignorance God winked at. But notice what he says then concerning how man saved by Christ. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, 30. There was a time when God allowed things to exist that he did not say that's the way it's always going to be. Now in his infinite wisdom he permitted then a writing of divorcement to protect the woman until the time would be for him to go back and restore what had been set up in the beginning in Eden. And that's exactly what our Lord is doing here. There was, of course, an immediate reaction. And you see it here. If the case of the man is so with the wife, that is, if a man can only put away his wife for the cause of fornication, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Then they conclude, well, it's not advantageous for a man to even marry if it's that strict. This is not hard reasoning. It's simple reasoning. A life of celibacy was desired over married life. Why? Because you've made it so stringent, as you do in Matthew 19, 9. Now, the significance of their statement is that they 
understood Jesus. And what did they understand him to do? They understood that he had bound his teaching on all men. And it was stronger than the teaching of Moses or the rabbis. This question of saying, maybe we should marry, means they understood exactly what Jesus said. Because they were used to, in the Jewish society, of marrying and divorcing pretty way they wanted to. That's the reason I went over these two different views of Shammai, rabbis, Shammai, and Hillel. That's where the Pharisees were coming from when they posed this question. Which side are you on? Jesus said, I'm not on each side. In fact, he could have said, I'm on my side as the Son of God. And he went back to the beginning and pointed out how marriage in the home started. Then he explained to them why there was a, real, a, a, a bill of divorcement. It was to save the woman's life. The wisdom of God, absolutely amazing. And that was all temporary. But now when the New Testament is coming under the Christian age, God's restoring things. And so he directs them back to the beginning. In the afternoon, we're trying to study a thing about restoration principles. Well, right here is a proof of restoration. It has nothing to do with restoring the gospel in the church. It has to do with restoring the first God-ordained institution. And here he reaches all the way back to the beginning. It goes way beyond the existence of of the Jews and the law of Moses and how they approach God under the law. And he says, here's where it's going to be. So in effect, he restored the law of marriage. And this shows you that when you fail to rightly by the word of truth, you'll end up in some way or the other on some subject like the Pharisees and Sadducees did. So it's vital that members of the kingdom realize that Jesus Christ went back to the original plan for marriage. And by his authority, set forth his teaching on divorce and remarriage. And it all begins in the beginning. Jesus now corrects the misconception, or misunderstanding at least we may call it, of the disciples. And further instructs them. He replies to their statement. It is not expedient to marry. Here's what he said. That was their conclusion. Remember, expedient is, this, is an advantage. So they've concluded that with this, it's going to be this strict in Matthew 19, 9, then it's better, it's advantageous to us not to even marry. So Jesus replies, not all men can receive this statement. Not all men can receive this statement, Matthew 19, 11. Because I know from the beginning, too, that celibacy is not God's original plan. I found this that I thought was interesting from a commentator by the name of Linsky. And he states, and I quote, The disciples show not that they are in favor of the asceticism of celibacy, but are reluctant to give up the Jewish ease of getting rid of a wife. Now, you will watch among a great many people. And how they choose what they consider to be a standard of right and wrong says, how easy is that on me? None of us like to sacrifice things. Sacrifice means I need this, or at least I think I do. And I depend on it. It's part of my life. I'm comfortable with it. Don't tell me I have to give that up or take something else on. And this was really jarring the ground under these disciples. But you know, regardless of how much it jarred the ground under those disciples, didn't change the Lord's teaching at all. He compromised not one whit. So he doesn't alter his teaching because of this objection from his own disciples. But he names some who could receive or to whom it had been given not to marry. And we didn't want to look at that a moment. He mentions three classes of eunuchs. The first are those who are born with a physical defect. And the second class are those who have been made eunuchs by men. And both of these groups are eunuchs for life because they're incapable of sexual activity. The third group that he mentions are those who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. 
Now this third group making themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God is a spiritual thing and not a physical condition. God's plan for man is reflected in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. It is not good for man to be alone. However, it may be wise for some to be eunuchs for the kingdom of God's sake, Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, and under certain conditions. And Paul deals with that when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 26. There was some sort of persecution being brought against the church. He calls it in that passage, the present distress. And he says in this present distress brought upon the church by way of persecution, it's better that you be as I am. Well, Paul had elected not to marry. Now, here's something we fail to realize sometimes. If I choose not to marry because I have control over my sexual desires, and I do it for the kingdom of heaven's sake, and that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. Then I must realize I'm not under the responsibilities of a husband or a father. That begins to tell us something about why Paul was saying to the Corinthians, in view of this peasant distress brought upon the church in the sense of persecution, it's better to remain single. You know why? I'm responsible for myself. If you're a husband, you're responsible at least for a wife. The present distress would not alleviate your responsibilities set upon you by the truth of God concerning the role of husband. And if you have children, you have responsibilities of a father. So Paul's saying in view of this pressure, we might call it, this distress that's brought upon the church, it's better not to marry. Because he turns around and says, but if you have married, you haven't sinned. So we understand from that we're authorized for the kingdom of heaven's sake as Paul did and by way of example to choose not to marry. We don't usually think that way. We try to figure out ways either not to marry but to still live as we were married immorally or we simply try to go ahead and reshape everything to suit ourselves. The greatest enemy we have is we try to suit ourselves and still thank God and be happy with it. So this celibacy is not a forced one. That is the third class. But it's for those who can receive it or make room for it, if you can do it. We won't try to get into all that the Bible has to say in the New Testament concerning things like this. There are a number of things that is lawful to do, authorized by Christ to do, but it may not be better to do them. All things are lawful, Paul said. But all things are not expedient or advantageous. We must have biblical authority for all we believe in practice, Colossians 3.17. But all things aren't obligatory. And we have choices. We must have authority when it comes to becoming married. We must have authority for what the role of husband and father is and wife and mother. But we also have the right to choose not to for reasons we've just set out. Now, if we do not choose to receive the apostle saying, it's not expedient to marry, and we do choose to marry, then we are guided by the authority of Christ regarding marriage. It's not God's plan for man to put away his wife for every cause. And the only reason, as stated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, is sexual unfaithfulness. The word fornication from the Greek word pornea means any kind of sexual relationship outside the realm of a Matthew chapter 19 verse 6 God joined marriage because everything that man calls marriage doesn't mean that God says it is. First thing we've got to do is say let us engage in a marriage as God defines marriage and operate accordingly. Now I know there may be a number of questions that arise in people's minds about details of some of these that we have not time to go into, so we're dealing only with this specific situation, but I would be glad to entertain any questions somebody might have on the matter. Let me simply point out in closing one more thing that ought to be understood. 
And that is the classifications of those who are authorized by God to enter into a scriptural marriage. First of all, let's point out that those who have never been married previously may without sin or transgressing God's will, 1 John 3, 4, marry so long as they themselves marry an eligible, from God's perspective, in the sight of God, partner. 1 Corinthians 7, 28 reads, But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. So it's obvious then that a person can marry if they've never been married. And the person they're marrying is also authorized by God to marry. The second class is that those who have been, have been previously married, but whose former companions did, that is, a widow or a widower. Paul reasons this way in Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to the husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of the husband. So then if... While her husband liveth, she's married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if the husband's dead, she's free from the law, so that she's no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Obviously then, as is said in most marriage ceremonies, trying to stick with the Bible, until death do us part. There's the first two classifications. The third one is those who have been previously married, but whose former companion was guilty of fornication unfaithfulness of the marriage vow, sexual activity. And here our text, Matthew 19, 9, shows plainly that Jesus gave to the innocent party, the one innocent of fornication, the innocent spouse, the right to seek another marriage partner, having put away the spouse guilty of fornication. If Jesus had given no exception. His language would have taught that every person, every person puts away his companion and marries another is guilty of adultery. Now, if you go over and listen to me on this, if you go over to Mark chapter 10, the first 12 verses, Jesus sets forth the rule. One man for one woman to death through them part and if one or the other engages in a marriage, simply adultery. Some people have gone to that and seen Matthew 19, 9 contradicts Matthew, uh, Mark 10. No, it doesn't. He who gave the rule has the right and authority to give the exception. And in Mark 10, you find the rule. In Matthew 19, verse 9, you find the exception. It's no use trying to say, well, let's just go by Mark and get Matthew. It's not the way you study the Bible. It has nothing to do with the right of the word of truth. Remember, you must take all of what the Bible says on a given subject in its immediate context and remote context before you reason with it and draw your conclusion as to how you're to act. You cannot find the very plan of salvation all in one verse or two verses. You have to understand that you must cover in the Bible all that the Bible has to say, specifically the New Testament, where the authority of Christ concerning salvation is found and determine after you look at all those what God requires. And thus we concluded one must believe in Christ based upon the evidence of the truth, Romans 10, 17. Repent of sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess one faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 and Acts 2, 38. But you don't get all that in one verse. And so it is when it comes to studying any topic, marriage, divorce, remarriage included. You have to look at what all the Bible says in its proper context. So he gave an exception, making it very clear that those who companions have been guilty of sexual unfaithfulness may put the guilty parties away and marry another according to Matthew 19.6. That another, of course, would have to be one who's qualified to marry. So what do we learn? Well, those who have a living former companion who was not put away because of fornication. Matthew 19, 9, Jesus said, And he that marrieth her when she's put away commits adultery. Matthew 5, 32. 
Next, those who marry anyone who has a former companion, still living, who was not put away because of fornication. In Matthew 19, 9, Jesus said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except the, the exception, the clause of exception has this force. If and only if, if and only if for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. You might want to compare that with Matthew 5.32. And then those who were put away because of their unfaithfulness, Matthew 5.32. Now, the, the verses to which we've referred here, when you put them all together, give the proper kind of thinking, study, meditation, clearly teach the positions that are set forth as to who is authorized to contract Matthew 19, 6, God join marriage, and who is not. We're living in a land that spurns virtually anything can they concerning God and Christ and the Bible. Sadly, even among members of the church, the authority of Christ is not appreciated. Yet Christ said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And when Jesus began in Matthew 19, 9, he said, Whosoever, how broad is whosoever? As broad as the human race. That's where these things apply to all humans everywhere. All men are amenable to the Christ. They may not know it. That's part of why we preach the gospel to all men, to teach them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Men are lost in sin, Romans 3, 23. And by that sin they're separated from God, Romans 6, 23. Thus we must teach the truth not only in what the plan of salvation is, but all things pertaining to marriage in the home and anything else pertaining to life and godliness. If you're not a Christian, we've studied a moment ago the plan of salvation. We urge you to believe it and from the heart obey it to become simply a Christian. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. A member of the church Jesus built and purchased with his blood. As a child of God, you're on a course of saying the rest of my life, however short or long that may be, I'm going to learn the will of heaven. I'm going to bring my thoughts and my life into harmony with it and subjection to the truth that I learn. Thus, if as a child of God you have wandered from any position that is authorized for Christians to accept and abide by, we urge you to repent of those things, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. And thus we have an invitation song designed to encourage you to respond to Christ according to your needs while we stand and while we sing.